Looking for strategies to help you protect your portfolio in these uncertain times? Visit robblack.com. Robblack.com. Powered by EP Wealth. Thanks for joining me on this journey towards retirement. I do appreciate it. I really do. You start off young, coming out of college, you get a job. First thing you should do is max out, start a 401k at your job. Have some money taken out of your paycheck and save. Because you're young, you might not do it. You're like, I'll do it when I'm late. 25, I'll do it at 30. I'll do it at 35, 40. There's, look, there's things we want to spend money on. I get it. Best thing you could do, though. There's some great stories on Wall Street today that I want to get to. Tomorrow, the Federal Reserve is going to cut interest rates. That is, is expected. If they didn't, I, I would almost think that the stock market would have a heart attack. Um, the S&P 500 is near an all-time high close. Uh, not quite there until the end of the day. Will we get it? In the end, I, I tend to say it's really not that important. But I want to reward you and say this is what happens when the Fed stops raising interest rates and the next move is to lower we hit all-time highs the markets hit all-time highs seven out of ten years so as much of a pessimist as you are stop it stop it you're hurting yourself stop trying to get free advice on investing and think that it's great advice i would be very cautious on that Trying to do a lot too much yourself. Financial planning is complicated and investing is, is it's not as easy as taking a look at a Motley Fool news, newsletter. If it were, we'd all be doing it. So 5670 is the range on the, 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 the top of the S&P 500 recently. Can we break through that today? It's a big question. Uh, where do we close? I don't have an answer for you on that one. So, but we'll be talking about it. Um, I like the S&P 500. If I were putting new money to work today, it probably would not be in the S&P 500 because I've got plenty of it. Large cap growth, I've got plenty of. Um, individually, now it's interesting. My 401k, I have a lot of Russell 2000. No, I have a, a healthy allocation, not a lot. I want to be very, very careful on this one. Um, so how you allocate your, your 401k, you know, I said everyone who's starting to work should put money in the 401k. It's kind of a tic-tac-toe board on how you should allocate. And at the top of the tic-tac-toe board is the word high, uh, at large, and then it goes medium and then small. So that, that covers one vertical axis and the horizontal axis, you hit growth, growth and income and income. So there's nine different boxes, right? And you want a large cap income or a large cap value. These words have different meanings. Um, income and value are kind of similar. Growth is growth for sure, but it's not hyper growth. It's not you know, AI growth. But you kind of want maybe 50% in S&P 500. That's going to get you a little bit of international. Then you go 25% mid, 25% small, and you're like, oh, that's too, too aggressive. So you start playing with the numbers that... You massage them to where you want to be. If you're conservative and, and you want the S&P 500 to get it, uh, you would overweight that. If you're aggressive, you overweight small cap and mid cap. And that really hasn't worked in the last five years. That's been the bad idea, but it'll work again. But in the last five years, the large cap S&P 500 has been the winner, winner, chicken dinner. And I think in large part because the cash flows. Remember I was telling you uh, that I'm starting to look at some metrics, just playing with them and um, trying to do a little bit more studying on what means importance to um, people like Warren Buffett. You know, you look at, you start your filters and you look at like the 400 of the largest profitable companies in the United States and you look at their free cash flow and their growth rates. Then you select 75 of the highest free cash flowers out of the 400 most profitable companies. And then you put another filter on top where you select the top 50 stocks with the highest growth. And then you weight the, the stocks and you've suddenly got a portfolio. If, your portfolio manager. Um, it's interesting stuff. Studying free cash flow and studying total addressable market. 
I want you to study, but I want you to be very careful on how you apply what you hear. And if you're just hearing from radio shows and websites and emails, you have a very, very poor uh, investment strategy. Um, let's move on. Uh, one of the more interesting stories that I saw today that I knew that I wanted to talk to you about was NVIDIA. No, well, well, before we do that one, this one's pretty sexy. Oracle chairman Larry Ellison, he became the world's second richest man yesterday. I I didn't think of you. I didn't think he was going to creep up that list again. We're talking about 2000 software company Oracle. Woo. But because he has such a large percentage, he became the world's second richest person pulling past Amazon founder Jeff Bezos as the software company stock surged. Elon Musk still number one. But Larry Ellison pulled out. And doesn't Larry Ellison look fantastic for 80 years old? A little bit, a little bit glossy, a little bit shiny. Um, moisturizer, may, I, maybe, or some sort of weird reptilian skin disease. I don't know, but he looks great for 80, right? Okay. Um, United Airlines teaming up with SpaceX Starlink to offer flyers free Wi-Fi. Hawaiian Airlines is also linked up with the satellites. Um, one thing that I fear is, you know, how Elon Musk has this tendency to like tweet crazy stuff. Like, uh, he's under in some hot water this week for tweeting over the weekend. Why isn't Harrison Walls being shot at after Trump was not shot at, but another gunman was found near him? So Musk got into a lot of trouble. The Secret Service are going to be looking into him. And uh, what if he has Wi-Fi on planes? And that's not that, that that's not something we have to have, right? But what are the governments that tells them like we're shutting down X because you're saying some crazy stuff, or we're going to find you, or we're going to put you in prison? Um, it's happened, right? The founder of Telegram uh, got arrested in France for basically not monitoring the content that people are posting messages through his encrypted service. But what if Elon Musk has a hospital in? like Lebanon or Gaza that needs his Wi-Fi satellite emergency data internet, right? What if he goes, I'm going to turn that off if you put me in prison. Like he's starting to become one of those really, really powerful men where you can't really threaten them because so many of the services that are out there, some of them are, are deemed critical. He has a finger in, right? NVIDIA stocks gaining today. There's strong, there's strong demand. There's signs of strong demand for its next generation chips coming from the supply chain in Asia. Stocks hitting about 119 this morning. NVIDIA's ability to continue its rally has been under question after the company's issued underwhelming sales guidance last month. Wall Street analysts have generally backed the company's next generation Blackwell chips um, to fuel further growth. NVIDIA is an interesting one, right? Um, everyone loved it as it was shooting up to 1400 and then it did its stock split and it starts setting, you know, back to the, towards the hundred level. I still own shares of NVIDIA and, um, I will say this, I, I believe NVIDIA in 10 to 20 years will be a lot like a story like Intel, or it could become a story like Intel where it's best days, Intel's best days were the eighties and nineties and early two thousands. Um, but in the last 20 years, it hasn't been nearly as relevant as the semiconductor cycle on GPUs versus CPUs. CPUs feels pretty full. Arm Holdings licenses a lot of the technology out there for the CPU world. Arm looks like the more attractive investments on computers, whereas NVIDIA looks like the more attractive investment on graphic processors and artificial intelligence and um, driving automated robots, uh, anything that can create kind of a visual 3D world, um, they're really good at, but they're also really good at the artificial intelligence chips. So that stock is moving a little bit higher today on news out of suppliers that there's strong demand for the new chips. Is that enough to get you excited? I don't know. Here's kind of something that I am playing with. It's in my notebook and I look at my notes every day. Um, Yesterday, there was a story out that Amazon is ordering employees back to the office Monday through Friday. That 
the hybrid roles that permit people to come into the office just three days a week is, is starting to, to end. They expect everyone to make the commute in all five working days. Company wants to make its offices feel like 2019 again. CEO Andy Jass, he said before the pandemic, it was not a given that folks could work remotely two days a week, and that will also be true moving forward. The memo says the company is also looking to have fewer managers in its structure, maintaining that both changes will strengthen its culture and effectiveness. A lot of people feel that Andy Jassy is trying to go back to 2019 and, and say this is where we should be. A lot of people are angry at the company, insiders, because they feel like they're just going backwards and not back to a better time. That three-day hybrid work weeks are better than five days a week in the office. If Andy Jassy gets this to stick and Amazon does get employees to come back five days a week or they get fired, you're going to see every big tech company do the same thing. One. Would that create more productivity? I think the bet on Wall Street is that it would. More productivity means we can deal with higher inflationary cost at corporations. More productivity means we're getting more for less from our workers and our labor costs. And that could fuel a big boom in the economy, U.S. economy. Again, are we there yet? I don't think we are, but it's worthy of note. This is an important one to watch. In my opinion, um, I think it has huge ramifications for the U.S. economy. Visit the Rob Black Show online at robblackshow.com. Listen to archived podcasts, market updates, and information from EP Wealth's certified financial planners online at robblackshow.com. Some business models change. Take, for instance, the legacy brands of luxury items. There's a big antitrust FTC court case going on right now between Tapestry and Capri. Should they be allowed to merge or not? They say that they should because social media, one post from Taylor Swift, could put a whole new handbag into play, and it's not one of their brands. Things change. I bring that up in large part uh, because it's part of the financial planning world where you do need to actively manage and actively pursue information. Big event coming up Thursday, the 26th with CFP Chad Burton. If you want to learn about some of the changes in wealth preservation, retirement planning, and income in retirement, Juniper Hotel, Cupertino, CFP Chad Burton and myself will be there 6.30 to 8.30. I'll get there probably around 5 if anyone wants to show up early and chit-chat. Uh, and we always stay until the very, very end as well. Uh, you can sign up at chadburton.com or robblackshow.com. Chad, we were talking during the breaks, and sometimes that's the stuff you want to hear on air, right? Um, I've been in this industry, financial media, for 25 plus years, and stock options, they're, they're so lucrative for the brokerage firm, and they're so lucrative as far as profits go for the company selling them and selling you the information on how to use them. I've seen this product, you know, stock option strategies uh, being sold as you too can get rich like the pros. We'll teach you the secrets in one day trading class. Um, but now that's the negative side. Let's talk about the positive side. Uh, you have some examples of options with Apple and uh, big positions like Microsoft that people might have. Yeah, we talk about, uh, we just talked about selling covered calls on a position that you already own, which is a, a way to create some income now. Mm -hmm. on a position that you don't necessarily want to sell. And um, it will limit the upside. That's important to note. And But it can create cash for you and income if the stock moves sideways or down. So selling a call to somebody else gives you the gives that person or entity the right to buy the stock from you at a higher price. Um, and now the other thing we haven't talked about is what's called buying a put and a put is insurance, right? It's just like term life insurance. You pay for it. And if you never die early, you know, nobody gets any money out of it. You know, eventually term insurance becomes too expensive and it goes away. So that's what you got to think of as puts puts is insurance. You're trying to say, I'm, I, 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 I maybe I want to protect the downside on this position and that costs money. And so if you have situations, which we often see people have, um, especially close to retirement or after a huge run up in a position that they own and keep in mind, if you work for a company, you typically can't do this, what I'm talking about. So if you work for NVIDIA or Apple, you're not going to be able to uh, typically sell calls or buy puts if you're still working there. But let's say 
you own a large position, and typically you're talking about more than a half a million dollars in a single position to do this, and you want to, you know you need to sell this thing or a certain amount, but you don't want to sell it this year because maybe there's a, there's a tax purpose to it. Maybe if you sell more and you have giant, more capital gains, you'll get hit with a Medicare, uh, that 3.8% tax, or there's something else going on in your life where you've got, you know, next year you're retiring, so your, your income is going to be much lower and you can sell at a lower bracket, right? Mm-hmm. So what you can do is you can sell calls, which can limit your upside and use that income to buy protective puts. It's considered what's called a a costless caller. So I'm going to give a very rough example. This is not real life. This is just something that I looked at a couple of days ago, for example. So right yesterday, um, when I was looking at this, NVIDIA was trading around 114 bucks. So you could sell calls that expire all the way out to December um, at 156. So that means that if the position moves above that, let's say it goes to 160, that selling a call means you're limited on your upside to 156 on the stock price. Now that could create enough income to buy protective puts at 96. So it creates a known event, right? Like you, you know, in this situation that, um, you're the first, if the stock drops, you can get hit with potentially up to the first around 15% decline. But after that, it's very limited in terms of your loss exposure. You can say, okay, I need to sell this. I'm really, I I think it's still going to go up, but if things go wrong, my downside is limited. It starts to be very limited after about 15% in this scenario. Right. And again, this is not real life option. Uh, They change, they trade all day long. So these, these numbers change all the time. Now on the upside, in this scenario, you're still participating in the upside up to about the first 30%, but after that, your upside becomes limited. So if the stock really runs, let's say it doubles again, you're only going to get uh, you know, 30% of that upside, which is still really good, right? That's a really great return on a position you know you want to sell. Um, so NVIDIA is one example. I mean, Apple is another one where it's a little less volatile. So um, the same type of a scenario in an Apple case means you could say, okay, I can participate in the next like you know, majority of the upside up to about 11%, and then it starts to eat away at my upside potential. But in this scenario, I'm pretty well protected beyond a 10% decline. So you're essentially using income from the selling the call, which limits your upside to buy, use that income to buy insurance, which can limit your downside. That's called a caller. And so when you have a position that you know you own too much of and you know you're trying to put off the sale of it into a different tax year or at least hedge some downside because you're scared, that can be a very, very useful tool um, in in financial planning. It's We've got really about... hard to explain on radio, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and that's why they make such tricky investments and why they're kind of sexy and easy to sell um, in seminars, which you do not want to do. You want to work with an accredited firm. Um, like a CFP financial planning relationship. I would not, here's what I, I'll, I'll boil it down. I would not tell listeners of the show to go out and try to buy options on their own. It's too tricky. It's, it's too tough to, to, to pull off correctly. Um, any final thoughts, Chad, as we wrap up today's show? I know. I think that, um, you know, we, we have had this, this run of one of the longest performance outperformance of large cap growth, yep. um, that I've seen in the 30 years that I've been doing this. And so you are starting to see that rotation. You're starting to see more focus on fundamentals where you've got to kind of offset your, your investments in tech and growth and that huge revenue growth that we're seeing out of AI with some of the things that aren't as expensive and maybe pay, pay a little bit better dividend, um, you got to have your portfolio fixed so that five years from retirement, your portfolio looks like you want it to look the day you retire. Questions about Social Security? Check out the Social Security Retirement Guide at robblack.com. That's robblack.com, powered by EP Wealth. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial money, investing, and more. Thanks for listening to this show. Thanks for supporting me through the years. I'm now getting to the age where I can honestly think about retirement. The thing that terrifies me the most is when I take my foot off the gas, will I have enough income to get a new roof? Not enough income to eat. I know I'll be good there. Will I have enough income to last me until I take Social Security, hopefully at 70, so I can get the max payout there? 
Or do I want to look at my health profile and say, nope, take it at 62 or 65? I don't know. Some decisions I'm, I'm putting off a little bit. Some I'm going to do to defer to my CFP, Brad, who works at EP Wealth with Chad. Um, there's a lot of questions that I have. I don't know anything about Medicare. Um, I know about investing and about money. I know about cash management. I know about budgeting. I know about creating wealth. One of the things I'm going to do at the new event is talk about an area that I'm, I'm starting to put some new investments on. Someone asked me recently my thoughts on uh, setting up a growth profile uh, portfolio. And I've taken a really, really long time in getting back to the person because to me, I want to have a, a, the right answer, not the right answer, um, but I want to think about it enough so that I'm not rushing to him an answer that is not fleshed out. And I think one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to try to talk about that at the event on Thursday, just in, in small amount, because it's really not a growth investment seminar. Um, but I really, really like the idea of pushing yourself and saying, what would you invest in right now? And I, I have to be honest with you. Um, it's not the same thing that I would have invested in the last 15 years. I think AI is still early. I think robots haven't even started into the first inning yet, but they're coming. But there is one more area that I'm, I'm super excited about that I'm not going to mention today. I'm going to talk about it on Thursday. And again, it's only going to be very, very briefly. I don't want you doing what I do. That's one of the things that is pretty important and pretty critical. Um, I got an email from, so when, for the record, it's not tech oriented. It, it's more along the lines of uh, fi the finances, the area that I'm looking to deploy new money into. And I feel really good about it. Because like I said, I, I tend to take everything really, really slow when it comes to giving advice. I'd rather not hurt you than anything else in the world. Someone sent me, and this is off topic. It's not the guy who's asking me about a growth portfolio. He, I think he wanted me to say, okay, here, uh, Microsoft Alphabet, uh, Amazon, Apple. I, and that's not my growth portfolio at this point in time. That's my moderate growth portfolio. They, they've moved. I don't expect them to have the same type of results. Microsoft, maybe. Google looks like a pretty big value right now. Meta, I think, is a, a, a growth stock still. They just seem to... At some point in time, if, if Mark Zuckerberg shuts down the metaverse, they pull in an extra $10 billion. Boom, just like that. So I'm going to do this live and on air, and it's not cool that I'm doing this. It's not terrible that I'm doing it. But someone's looking at, got me an email, and he's talking about AI. And interestingly, he, he gave me a stock to take a look at. Um. And it kind of scares me a little bit. Um, it's not a good stock. And that worries me a lot. Where am I going at with this? You want to look at a revenue of a company. You want to look at the earnings. You want to look at the margins. You want to look at the return on equity, return on investment. ROE, ROI. There's a couple things that you can throw out there that are going to be super important. Some people are, at this point in time, reaching for straws. And they're trying their best to get into options. I would not ever, never, ever recommend two-time options, three-time options on a daily basis or on a weekly basis. That's supposed to be how they're played. But I know people who try to own them for the long term. And I don't like trading. So they, the option investments that are tied towards market volatility, um, not my thing. B 
be cautious on how you approach what you want in investing. I like revenue. I like when for individual stocks. Okay, here's a better way of, of, of framing this for individual stock. For most of us, the way we should accumulate wealth is through index funds and ETFs. I think that's the simplest way of doing it because ultimately, like if you do an index fund, you're kind of betting on America. But see, when someone asks you about, you know, how would you set up a growth portfolio right now? I'm very aware that Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, NVIDIA, Google, Alphabet, um, all have very, very high PEs because everyone knows about them. That the S&P 500's return has been largely based on those seven stocks, the Magnificent Seven, for the last 18 months. Companies like Intuit aren't pulling their fair share. That bothers me enormously because it's too concentrated of a play. It's a crowded play. If you know about NVIDIA now, and I know about NVIDIA now, everyone kind of knows. So what I think works for the next 15 years is not what worked in the last 15. You need to find the frontier in robotics. You need to understand AI a little bit more independently from the first thing that we've learned is the hardware comes first. NVIDIA owns that. Dell is a big player. I don't like that little company, SMCI. It's not my play. Um, compared to Dell, they're shabby. Super micro. And again, that's just my own opinion. Um, I think the next level of AI will be on the software side. And then on top of that, I think you'll start seeing it bleed into companies like Target trying to figure out how to cut down theft. Companies like Uber trying to figure out when to staff drivers. But the third thing that I'm thinking about is a financial play. And it's not big, it's not a bank, it's not a broker. It's tied towards the financial industry on financial planners. Um, we'll talk about that on Thursday in Cupertino. Looking at the markets day, it's, it's, eh. um, it's, eh. there's some losers. Amazon, Microsoft, Caterpillar. Caterpillar was up 14 yesterday, it's down four today. I like Caterpillar. This is a good example of a stock that I own in it for my retirement account. Pretty sure they're going to be around. It gives me some growth. And it gives me a little bit of income. Probably not enough income for me to say this is going to be my retirement because I want $1 million to pay me $40,000 a year. $1 million in assets. So $1 million in Caterpillar would only pay you about $15,000 a year. But... I know what you're saying. How's it done in the last year? In the last year, it's gone from 270 all the way to 370. It's been a big winner. So it's still got a very nice growth, more so than income profile. Um, and if you look at the last five years, it's gone from 147 to 369. I've owned it for the last five years, and when I get a dividend, I just reinvest it. When I take my foot off the gas, I'm going to be like, give it to me now. Give me that cash. And I don't want you to own what I own. I just want you to try to see what I'm thinking. Um, another income play that'll keep me needing bonds, needing to get to that 4% yield, is like a company like a Target. On a one-year basis, underperformer. Um, well, in the last year, it's gone from 110 to 155. Um, in the last five years, it's gone from 92 to 155. But in there, the market's done better than it. And it was as high as 261. So at one point during COVID, we were buying hand over fist. Target will get it right, but they're not a great grower. And their dividend yield's really attractive compared to Walmart. 2.8%. So sometimes you got to use the word compare when it comes to investing. Walmart has a 1%. So you're getting almost 2.8 versus 1. That's a pretty big difference. But with Walmart, you can't say that it's one year or five years bad. In the last year, it's gone from, good golly, 52 to 80. 
That's better than your tech stocks probably. In the last five years, it's gone from 37 to 78, beating the market and giving that little dividend of 1%. Um, after those two retailers, the only one that I would even consider is Amazon. I do think Amazon is going to be coming up with a dividend soon. And I think that'll be a catalyst for the stock. I think they'll benefit from AI. Um, when you take a look at the one year of Amazon, it's gone from 120 to 180. It doesn't feel like it, right? If you take a look at the last five years, it's only gone from 94 to 180. So the five year hasn't been nearly as good. And man, I look at that dividend sitting there at zero. I'm like, you kind of need to do this, guys. Anyhow, you can find me online at Rob Black Show. Come to the event Thursday, Cupertino. Juniper Hotel, the 26th, 6th, 3rd, 8th, 30th. Sign up at robblackshow.com. That's robblackshow.com. You are listening to the Rob Black Show podcast. For more information on EP Wealth, visit robblack.com. That's robblack.com. Rob Black talking all things financial money, investing, and more. Thanks for listening to the show. Big event coming up on the 26th of next week. I think I'm going to be probably, I'll be honest with you, I think I'm down to my last 10 events or less maybe last five or less as I move into something different, maybe webinars, maybe uh, pints and portfolios, but I might do half a year next year. I might do a whole year, but I'm at the point now where I'm, I feel like that guy, the sports guy who always Tom Brady, will I retire? Or will I not? Will I change what I'm doing and or not? I recently told my family that I don't want to retire in this house. I want to move to a beach. I've spent my whole career in this area and visibly I see work. I see people talk to me all the time. I was at an Irish bar the other day waiting for my kid to finish up football, snacking on some delicious food. And um, I got recognized while I was on the phone and I hate it because I was talking to a friend who's, you know, going through t issues and people are trying to like, not get a picture with me, but I just don't like being, I don't Sometimes you just kind of want to hide, you know? So EA, Electronic Arts, they hosted an analyst meeting this week. Um, I listened in on the notes. They plan to double its audience to 1 billion plus over the next five years. Wall Street wants more financials. The NBA Live publisher didn't really peg down a date for its anticipated Battlefield sequel. It's got a lot of franchises that aren't really all that hot right now. EA announced that they have 100 plus active AI projects, including game development tools that can generate characters and scenes. Sims 4 players will be able to use AI powered image search to find assets like outfits and houses. There's a Barbie Sim um, tied towards the movie and tied towards Margot Robbie's uh, production company that they're tied towards. We talked about video games a little bit. Modern games are often impossible to 100% finish, and that's by design. Games have longer shelf lives than ever. The Sims 4 was released a decade ago. It has 85 million players right now, four times as many as it had in 2020. EA is raking in the, what are called in The Sims, the simoleons. Three quarters of its annual net bookings come from live services like in-game purchases. Um... As a dad, it, it infuriates me the way they treat the Madden NFL franchise. My kid gets a little addicted to that kind of stuff, and he's playing football now, real football. And I'm so proud of him. I'm going to go see a game in Windsor this weekend with him. And it's like the best time. We just sit in the car, and he puts his headphones on and listens to Kanye. And then later on, we find each other in music. Um, so we'll play as loud as we can, 21 Pilots, the song Trees because it gets them all pumped up. Um, man, we've seen twice this year, 21 Pilots. Um, but in NFL Madden, the game EA has, they do just this heinous thing where they make you pay for packs of cards, like uh, football cards, trading cards. And inside your pack, you can get like really great players, but you can get some pretty average stuff. But they're digital players, and these packs cost real money. But developing a new video game costs hundreds of millions of dollars, and it could be a flop, and it's a huge financial hit. Sony pulled its recent shooter game called Concord from stores after two weeks. 
when the $100 million plus game was estimated to have sold fewer than 25,000 copies. Call of Duty sells millions and millions of copies. Next year, we're going to get Grand Theft Auto 6 out of Take 2 Interactive. Um, it's supposed to come out probably about this time. Maybe they'll push it to like November of 2025. About six months in advance, that stock's going to start getting more and more buzz as we start seeing it real for real coming out. Not a tease, but for real. Wall Street moves six months in advance, roughly speaking. Um, I think it's a discounting uh, tool. And right now, what the uh, stock market is telling us is in six months from now, things are going to be okay. I know you're saying, how do you know that? There could be a nuclear strike. That's where, that's where the stock market can't predict. There could be terrorism. It could have a game changer. Um, but when I look at the five-year chart of Take-Two Interactive, because this game's been in development, Grand Theft Auto 6, for 10 years, they still make money off Grand Theft Auto 5. Lots of it. My kids will still boot it up on uh, weekends when a friend's been in the night, and uh, they'll, they'll play some missions. The last five years, the stock really hasn't done much. So this is starting to become more interesting to me. Now, again, Grand Theft Auto 6 will be the biggest entertainment title of all time. Because right now, Grand Theft Auto 5 is the biggest entertainment title of all time. Now, is it guaranteed? No. Nope. Is it a strong possibility? I think so. Grand Theft Auto has sold over 200 million copies in its lifetime. And you can do the math. 200 million copies. They don't typically sell at discount. You times that by $50, even though the game could run a lot more. And you're talking about $10 billion. And then once you get the game, you can buy add-on packs. Avatar is not even close to this. Not even close. So... When I took take a look at a ten billion dollar play, I'll take a look at the stock and I'll go, okay, it's trading at twenty six billion. Okay, they they have to have something else. But that's a pretty that's a pretty good franchise. Take two interactive to me looks really interesting around one forty. For the long term patient investor, it is not instant gratif gratification. And if the game gets delayed, you're going to be sitting on a hit to the stock. We'll talk more about the Fed rate cut. The first 50 basis points doesn't get me wildly excited. Thinking about the next 50 to 150 basis points gets me a little bit more excited about our economy. I like where we're looking at six months from now. I feel very, very comfortable. Um, I do think the valuations of the S&P 500 is its probably biggest drag in the short term. Um, and I, I would be aware of that. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube Rob Black Show. I'm Rob Black talking all things financial, money, investing, and more. Talk to you soon. For more information about EP Wealth, visit robblack.com. That's robblack.com.